Okay, thank you all for uh, coming. Uh, belated Mother's Day for all the mothers. And uh, so we're gonna go ahead and um, go over our emergency preparedness as an institution. This is the drill that we go through every year. Um, as a reminder, June 1st is the official um, hurricane opening season. And as you guys recently saw that we are actually in the midst of a major global cyber threat that is currently going on. So it should serve as a reminder that we should prepare ourselves for at least the things that we can prepare for and be ready for something that is unexpected. So I'm gonna go over um, our um, agenda for today. Uh, here is our agenda. I'm gonna go over the Institutional Command uh, Response Center. Then Lance Wood from National Weather Service, he's gonna go over the outlook for 2017 uh, hurricane season. Uh, Felicia Evans will talk about employee preparedness. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Diori will go over safety and security. Frank will go over business continuity planning. Steve Campbell will go over communication plans from the institution. Uh, Luis Perrin, I think his job is even more relevant about cybersecurity. He's gonna go over in detail about our plan as an institution, and I think we've done a remarkable job over this weekend. And Mike Mestrangelo is gonna go over Stop the Bleed program, and Charles Carlisle is gonna go over fire preparation and response. You know, we as an institution have gone through so much, and the last thing we didn't go through was fire, and which we have already done in January. So you can see that there is, there is um, always a threat. The things that you think is least expected can happen. So here are the key points. So the main thing here is don't be complacent. So develop personal and fam family emergency plans now. Um, keep needed emergency supplies on hand. There is always a list available from the state and the local of, uh, of, uh, offices. Uh, talk with supervisor, faculty advisor, know your UTMB role before, during, and after emergency. I think a lot of you guys should have that orange card that should say E1. Update contact information in UTMB alerts, and uh, there is a IHOP policy 3.1.1, which talks about department business continuity plan during emergency situations. So here is our uh, flow diagram of our incident uh, command center and incident commander, which is gonna be uh, Dr. Um, uh, Calendar, and then we have four different section under operations, planning section, logistics, and admin and finance. I don't want you to know and in detail about that. The next slide is very busy. Technically, it is color coordinated to talk about operations and other plans. It is available on iSpace for you guys to look at. So what's new uh, this year? Um, after Hurricane Ike, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Sandy, CMS actually made this a mandatory that every institution that gets funding from CMS or that takes care of Medicare patient must have an emergency preparedness plan. So every hospital in the country that takes Medicare dollars must have this plan. So that is the new thing that CMS wants that. So whenever a joint commission comes in, they're gonna look for our emergency preparedness plan. All staff members are now required to go through emergency training. So the things in terms of priority risk this year, which is added to the existing list from the prior year is fire and business continuity and cyber security, which are added for this, uh, this year. So this is actually a evacuation planning checklist. It's also available on uh, iSpace. The idea here is uh, mostly for patient care. So every nurse manager uh, in the hospital side should have a plan to prioritize patient which can go home, which we need to evacuate to another institution. And we are actually carrying out that drill today. So lastly, I have this summary of roles in an emergency. The main thing is an incident command. So you got to listen from uh, any messages that are coming from the incident command center in terms of authorizing any closure of schools and offices. 
uh, supervisor and faculty advisor, they should f follow the lead of incident command in terms of uh, emergency preparation duties, timing of any unauthorized or authorized closures. Uh, similarly, for employees and students, they should also look for um, feedback from the incident command center, when to release the employees, when to bring the employees, when to close a particular school. With that, I'm going to pass it on. Um, before I go to that, you guys should have all signed up for UTMB alerts. How many of you guys got alert this weekend? Excellent. Everybody. I got five of them. <laughs> so, so, so make sure you have signed up for that. I know sometimes it can be annoying, but it will be very useful. That's why they try to track you in different ways. Email, text messages, phone, your, your personal phone, or your... Um, home phone, whatever you have registered um, on online. So next I'm going to introduce uh, Lance Wood from uh, National Weather Services and he's going to go over what is the forecast for coming um, hurricane season. Thank you, Lance. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, hopefully we won't see one of these guys this year, but uh, it's kind of a neat title slide anyway. But yeah, what we're going to talk about is the outlook for this season. And, when I talk about the outlook, I like to talk about a couple of other things as well, like what's new uh, for this season, so we'll also go over that. Um, I'm actually the Science and Operations Officer at the National Weather Service Office, so I, I do a lot of um, coordination with universities and try to look at some of the latest science that we can bring into operations, which is kind of my core job. So I do like to see kind of what's new for the year and scientifically how we can get better each year. So when we, we talk about the season, it's real important to define it. Um, as was stated earlier, it's, it's June 1st through November 30th officially. This is a frequency diagram. You don't really need to get hung up on the exact numbers, but, but notice where the peak is. It's, it's right around that early to mid-September time frame. And then you notice in June there's also a, a little bit of an increase in activity, and usually those June storms are in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. So we do definitely have to worry about um, that, that, that little increase you see in June. And you notice outside of the blue official season that there is, there is some activity. And so the season really encompasses about 97% of the activity that actually occurs. There is a little bit outside, and we actually saw that this year. We had a tropical storm, uh, Arlene, already happened in the Atlantic back in April. And that's only the second time in the modern era since satellites, if you think of that since the 1960s, that we've seen an April storm. So they can actually happen in our basin. And when we talk about the Atlantic Basin, we're talking about uh, the Caribbean, the tropical Atlantic, and the Gulf of Mexico. And for the Texas coast, one notable fact is we've never seen a hurricane make landfall on the Texas coast past mid-October. Uh, so Jerry was, in 1989, was, was the latest, and it was around October 16th. So our season does, does wind down towards the end of October. So yeah, there's kind of a lot on this graphic too, but one of the things we look at to figure out, you know, what is going to happen this year in the Atlantic Basin? Well, we actually look at the tropical Pacific to figure out what's going on because the water temperatures in the tropical Pacific affect the jet stream kind of across the winds at the middle and upper part of the atmosphere across the tropical Atlantic. And during an El Nino year, when you have the warmer than normal water in the tropical Pacific, you tend to have higher wind speeds across the tropical Atlantic which tends to disrupt circulations. So as a hurricane tries to get going, it encounters what we call wind shear, which is unfavorable. So that's why we look at that. Now what this actually is, is kind of looking at what's going on this spring, running our climate models forward, and then kind of looking at three month averages of our El Nino basically index. And so if you get above 0.5 on that graphic, that would be a forecast of an El Nino. You get above one, that's a strong, moderate to strong type El Nino. So you notice, most of our models in the yellow bar there is an average, a dynamical average of the, the models are showing that it is going to warm out there in the tropical Pacific, but they're not too much in agreement on the how much. Well, this year that's important because a moderate to strong El Nino really does shut down seasonal activity. A weak El Nino or a near normal type forecast does not. <laughs> so there is, there is kind of uncertainty. I think most likely what you're going to see is an El Nino developed towards the peak of the season. You know, it depends on how strong it is, whether or not it actually suppresses activity. So there's a group at Colorado State that's actually been doing these forecasts for a long time, and I would consider them, you know, pretty much the experts. Uh, our own agency, NOAA, will come out with an outlook. 
looks a little different than this. It's actually a range of possibilities. And you can look for that in late May, but it's not out yet. But a, a normal 30-year average type season, if you, know, if you look about what's happening in the last 30 years, is 12 named storms. That's, that's tropical storms and hurricanes. And then six, of, six hurricanes. And then the category three in reference to the Safford-Simpson scale, those would be your major hurricanes, those are two. So you can see that's the average year, and we're in Colorado State's forecasting 11, four, and two. So it's, it's real close to normal activity, obviously maybe slightly below. That's kind of trying to factor in that potential El Nino. I will say though, if that El Nino doesn't develop, the numbers are gonna be higher than that. So one thing I always like to get across when we talk about you know, rating hurricanes and, uh, and such, you, know, you really have to look at each one in, individually, you know, what, is, what are the impacts from this one? Is it a large hurricane? Is it a small hurricane? So don't get hung up too much on the category because that, that really is only the wind speeds. It says nothing uh, about really the surge that you're gonna get. Surge is a lot more complicated um, than just saying, hey, what is the maximum intensity? And we saw that with Ike, you know, only a category two, but brought a much, much more significant storm surge you might expect from a category two because of the large size. And you can even go back to when I first really got into this business uh, and back in, in, the, in the 90s when we had Tropical Storm Francis brought a fairly significant surge and was only a tropical storm. So one of the things that is new is since Hurricane Ike, you know, since Hurricane Sandy, as we've talked about, we, we, we know we needed to communicate potential storm surge risk a lot better than we had back then. So now we run an uh, ensemble of models uh, with storm surge and we kind of sum them up as a potential storm surge graphic. And it's also done in inundation, so you don't really need to know how, how high your home is. That's another problem. So basically, this is color-coded with blue being three foot of inundation and then yellow being more than three feet, and then the worst red would be greater than nine feet, which obviously is catastrophic. Um, so think of this as a reasonable worst-case scenario, and this will be out there as soon as there's a hurricane watch or even a tropical storm watch potentially would be out there. So within about 48 hours of impact. Um, and basically this only has about a 10% chance of being worse than this. That's kind of the way to look at it. We call it a 90% exceedance. Uh, and I think this is really gonna help planners make decisions of when we need to move people out of the storm surge risk zone. The other thing that's new this year and tropical storm bill in 2015 kind of highlighted this weakness is that what if you have a storm that's developing, like Bill was, right off the coast, yet we're not issuing any official products yet because it's not quite at the organizational level that it needs to be called a tropical storm, but we think it's gonna become a tropical storm basically as it's coming inland. Well, this year we're gonna be able to issue potential tropical cyclone advisory. So the Hurricane Center can coordinate with the local field office and say, hey, this is close to land. We wanna go ahead and put up a watch. So a hurricane watch or a tropical storm watch. So we're gonna go ahead and start advisory. So you're gonna get a full suite of products, a track forecast, even though officially it's not deemed a tropical storm yet. Um, it would be expected to say before it makes uh, landfall. Now, this won't happen if it doesn't impact land. So we're looking at systems that might impact land in the next couple of days. But think about Bill, and you know, we got a lot of questions. They wanted to know those questions that everybody wants to know. You know, how strong is it gonna get on the wind intensity? How much storm surge could it bring? yet we weren't running all that, those full suite of products. So it was more difficult to communicate. So with that, I think I will, will stop and I appreciate your attention. I'm Felicia Evans with the Department of Human Resources and um, I'll be here this afternoon to talk to you a bit about employee responsibilities during, as we prepare for an emergency. First off, one of the things that you always wanna remember to do, emergency or not, is to always have your employee badge present and visible. That'll be very important as you try to gain access to facilities um, before, during, and after an emergency. So you'll see this reminder come up several times as we're with you this afternoon. But in addition to that, one of the first things that um, you want to do is work with your supervisor to complete the annual employee emergency um, classification and acknowledgement form. Um, 
You may remember that this is a form that we ask you to complete every year um, by June 30th. Um, and for new hires, we ask that it's completed within 30 days of hire. Um, but we're going to do something a little bit different this year. We're asking that the form be completed online. Um, that gives um, Incident Command a much better ability to be able to identify who's here um, in an emergency, in an essential capacity during an emergency. Um, with the paper form, uh, compliance with completing it, as well as turning it in, has been very low traditionally. So being able to track and monitor it um, online helps to give us this critical information. Um, certainly another thing that you want to do very early on in, the, uh, in your emergency planning is to talk with your family. Um, make preparations for them based on what your role will be during an emergency. Um, you need to not only think about um, the physical needs of your family um, and the, family, the broader family, including your pets, um, but you also want to plan, plan for their social needs. So are there any individuals in your household that have special needs that you'll need to make sure that there are resources, resources and um, services available for during an emergency? Um, since we do have this one time a year um, classification process, you want to make sure that you're having conversations with your supervisors as your status changes throughout the year. Again, your physical status could change or your social status could change. Um, and so you want to make sure that you do those, have those conversations with your supervisor in advance of an emergency so that your supervisor has an opportunity to plan as well. Um, you also want to make sure that you enroll in my chart. Um, so that you'll have ongoing access to your medical records in the event that you or a family member are displaced during the course of an emergency. So we, we have this term, essential, and I've said it several times already, um, and so obviously there's also the other term, non-essential. But what we mean by essential could be one of four things. First, you could be asked to be a part of the shelter in place team in the event that we decide to house patients here at the Galveston campus as a part uh, of our emergency plans. Um, likewise, you may also be assigned to go with patients to another facility um, or assigned to work at an alternate location anytime before, during, or after the emergency. And then also you could be asked to relieve individuals that have uh, sheltered in place here um, immediately following the emergency, and you could be required to stay in, on site for several days. But one of the things that you really need to keep in mind about emergency classification is that even though you may be deemed non-essential, your status could be changed at any given time depending on the nature of the particular emergency. Um, also, your work responsibilities during the course of an emergency could be changed from those things that you're normally accustomed to doing. Other things that you can do right now, as I believe Dr. Sharman mentioned earlier, is um, prepare an emergency kit or an emergency bag so that you and your families are ready in the event that we have an emergency. Um, we do have a small handful of employees who um, have chosen not to be on direct deposit, but we encourage everyone to arrange for direct deposit because in the event of an emergency and mail services um, have halted, you won't, be, you won't have access to um, your paycheck. You know, there won't be any delivery of cash or anyone walking around with uh, paper checks to deliver to employees. Um, you also want to make sure that you have the um, orange emergency uh, essential hang tag as well as the orange placard that you use in your car in order to be able to regain access to buildings and parking um, on campus. And then finally, make sure that you've updated your emergency contact information in um, PeopleSoft. Now, the emergency contact information is different than that uh, that you'll use for the UTMB alerts. With, for your emergency contact, we need to know who do we contact if there is an emergency that involves you. Whereas with the UTMB alert, we want to know how do we get in touch with you if there is an emergency here at UTMB. So those numbers and those contact routes may be different. So at the time of an emergency, as I mentioned already, 
anyone can be designated as essential. Certainly on the day of the fire, there may have been individuals here who normally would have been non-essential in a planned event or um, an event for which we had notice, but that day it was all hands on deck and we needed um, everyone to mobilize and um, address that particular issue. So again, your role may change and your status may change based on the situation. Um, you definitely want to monitor all communications before, during, and after an emergency and obey those instructions. Um, you're going to perform duties that may or may not be the same duties as those that you normally assign, but you're going to take direction from your supervisor as well as incident command. And then you want to remain at your workstation until you are released by incident command and your supervisor. And this is, this is really important to keep in mind because Failure to adhere to this particular um, expectation could result in um, your pay being impacted. And so we'll talk about disaster pay next. So non-exempt employees who are deemed essential that are required to work during emer an emergency, they will receive their uh, pay, their regular hourly rate for all hours worked as well as any hours that they are expected to remain on site, and that would include any overtime hours that result from those requirements. For exempt employees who are essential and required to work, you will receive your regular salary, and then you may also receive a lump sum amount, and then that amount will be determined at the beginning of the emergency, and it will depend on the specifics of the emergency but we're no longer providing any type of compensatory time for being present during a disaster. Non-essential employees will receive uh, administrative leave for any regularly scheduled shift that occurs after the release has been given by incident command and the supervisor. Um, no supervisor has the authority to unilaterally release their employees. They should be taking guidance and direction from incident command. Um, and again, like I said, failure to uh, follow those directions could result in an employee having to use their own leave time or leave without pay as opposed to being granted the um, up to 40 hours of administrative leave time. If for whatever reason, following their emergency, an employee is not able to return um, once he or she has exhausted the 40 hours of administrative leave, then they would have to use their own leave accruals or potentially leave without pay. Um, one other thing to remember with disaster pay is that if there's a person, an employee who's already on leave at the time that um, the emergency begins, then they would continue to use their own leave for the duration of that scheduled period of time off. But then here we see that the president always has the option um, in extreme circumstances to grant additional administra administrative leave if um, that's warranted. So here are a few resources. Um, HR does have an emergency planning webpage. Uh, there, as Dr. Sharma mentioned, there's the staffing during adverse conditions policy. It's actually the first policy in the HR section of IHOP. Uh, the employee acknowledgement form and the adverse events toolkit, kit, which allows managers to do some planning around employee um, emergency contact information. Uh, it has a full battery of timesheets and other forms that would be helpful in the event that we lose uh, system connectivity uh, during the disaster. I want to show you guys very quickly uh, what the online emergency acknowledgement form looks like. This is the uh, HR emergency planning web page and the link to the online form is here. It's pretty quick to fill out. You can, you can ignore the access denied message. That's something that our partners in IS are working to get removed. But this is the new form. It has a set of definitions and expectations for essential and non-essential employees. It goes through notice incidents like hurricanes and other planned events, and then non-notice incidents such as the fire or some type of um, mass casualty. You'll want to check off that you've read and understand those definitions and responsibilities, and then it opens up a section for you to input your contact information. 
Much of this will pull in from uh, the existing directory information that's available. You'll select your campus. You can do a search for your building. And there's my building. And then it will ask for my specific location within the building. And I'm just going to select something. It gives you the ability to update your route, room number, location code, and then this will feed back into HCM and, and do the updates there as well. It automatically pulls in your immediate supervisor based on reports to information in HCM, and then I confirm that that information is correct, and then it opens up all of the acknowledgments that currently exist on um, the paper form, and so you'll check off all of those, and then you'll click to, to electronically sign the document and then you'll submit it. Once it's submitted, it triggers an email notification to your manager and your manager can open the form and mark uh, your classification, whether you're essential or non-essential, and then approve it. And both uh, you, the manager, and your employee file will get a copy of the document. Um, there'll also be the ability for reports to be run. So again, incident command, um, managers, uh, other administrative departments would have access to be able to see who are the essential versus non-essential employees located um, at the university at any given time. All right. So one more time, make sure that you have all of your alert, your uh, information updated in the UTMB alerts system so that as we have emergencies, you can get timely information about that. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Dior from University Police. Uh, thank you, Felicia. As indicated, my name is uh, Lieutenant David Dior. I'm the current page, uh, patrol commander for the UTMB Police Department. And today I'm going to cover the safety and security portion of the emergency operations plan. If you're an essential employee, you should be issued an essential employee placard uh, for your vehicle as well as your identification card. You will need all three items in order to access the campuses here at UTMB or any other campus if there's an emergency at Angleton or League City, you'll need all your items. <clears throat> if you're a non-essential employee, predominantly you want to make sure that you're not on campus because we will escort you off campus if you don't have the items. As Felicia indicated, there could be a point in time where you are a non-essential employee and that status changes. It's important that that information gets communicated to the incident commander, which will be passed down to us, so we can identify you as an essential employee. You'll need both, uh, if you're an essential employee, you'll need all three items to return back to campus. There could possibly be roadblocks that you'll encounter. If you don't have those documents, you may be turned around and sent back, uh, sent back home. Once you arrive on campus, we'll have designated officers at certain locations, as well as the parking garage will be designated for essential employees to park at. If you don't have a placard, unfortunately, you will not be able to park inside that garage. If you are parking in the garage, make sure that um, you identify what the incident is. If it's a hurricane, uh, we advise you definitely not to park on the first floor of the garage uh, and uh, might be some flooding occurring. Once you're on campus, make sure that you have your UTMB identification card with you at all times, as well as your essential placard that goes behind your badge. If you don't have both items, you will be detained until I can identify you know, what your status is and whether or not you have official business on campus. Securing property. Prior to you uh, leaving, once the, uh, the word is given and you just dedicated a, the, uh, the incident, incident command has been established, go over your, your belongings, what do you have in your office that could possibly um, you know, be taken. We want to make sure we record those, those serial numbers, what's inside your office, so when you do return, you can conduct the inventory and identify you know, if something's possibly missing and you can aid us with the uh, investigation. If you have any type of damaged property, please don't discard it. There may be an opportunity for UTMB to uh, obtain reimbursement for that property that is damaged. Uh, you can contact our police department for assistance. We can come out and investigate and conduct an investigation and identify uh, what has been taken in the event. Uh, part of the WEAR campaign, you know, it's an ongoing issue to make sure that uh, we have a safe and secure campus. So ensure that you always maintain your identification card and you have your official UTMB ID card with you. If you, and this uh, pertains to contractors as well, 
there's a UTMB official contractor badge that they must wear on campus. If you see somebody suspicious, you know, contact us. We'll determine whether or not they have official cam uh, business on campus. If not, then we'll escort them off the, uh, off the campus. Uh, so kind of to recap, if you have, if you're extension employee, make sure you have all three items with you when you're reporting back to the various campuses. Uh, make sure that you have your orange placard behind your UTMB ID badge. If you're on campus and you don't have both items, unfortunately, we'll have to escort you off. Uh, or may delay you from working here at UTMB, which that will have to go to the incident commander uh, for approval. Uh, that being said, I only had uh, three slides, so uh, we'll go to uh, Frank Von Lulis for the business continuity plan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Frank Von Lulis, Information Services. I'm here in my capacity of the institutional business continuity planning coordinator. So, as everybody knows, UTMB doesn't stop for no storm, we also don't stop for no cyber attack, and we stop for no fire. <laughs> Little applause, thank you, no. <laughs> really, business continuity, BC Play, is in our DNA. We've been doing this for over 100 years, and the context is really Yes, over time we're going to be faced with business interruptions, disaster events, business continuity planning is the effort of planning ahead, being prepared, having plans on a departmental level in place in case um, we um, face those business interruptions or events to continue our mission. It's as simple as that. Can stop the, no, well, let's go a little bit more detail what that means. Party risk, we already went over that. All the way down from an ex executive level, we're looking at all the risks um, that uh, we're facing at UTMB. Going towards um, the June 1st deadline, obviously, um, uh, we're having the uh, weather events, hurricanes that um, top the list, but we've also been exposed to um, utility out outages, disease outbreaks, mass casualties, cyber threats, and um, fires, so fire has been added um, as a party risk um, for 2017. So general strategy talk, looking at um, the different uh, mission areas, starting with education, emergency protective me measures, moving key assets, supplies, equipments, uh, where they're exposed um, to safer um, locations, compressing course schedules, Contingency for use of alternative space, very critical. Um, a section has been added for the 2017 uh, BCP template to um, uh, notate and um, list alternative space that has been identified. Don't just list it. If you're relying on other departments to provide that space, the institution has that space available. Um, do that in a coordinated fashion. and. Um, confirm that that space is available in um, a disaster um, for your departmental functions to continue. Research, again, emergency protective measures, um, a lot of planning in that area to um, save uh, pro appropriate handling um, of the um, research animals, staging portable equipment, emergency supplies. So in an emergency, um, identify the uh, supplies that are critical and work with um, uh, BOF to um, make sure that they're going to uh, be in place. Health system, really core in terms of, especially in an emergency and disaster, to continue wherever possible that important mission, that critical mission that um, UTMB is providing. Alternate space identified, we've seen that um, uh, in the aftermath of the fire that we quickly um, executed on those um, plans. Relocation, we have a robust um, uh, ambulatory service uh, in, at different clinics, so depending on the local situation, combining um, and, and relocating those resources, and um, augmentation through contractor resources. On the institutional support side, again, the backbone to continue those kind of um, services in alternate ways. Um, I know of uh, many of the business areas um, 
who test on a routine basis to perform their accounts payable, their payroll functions from an alternate work site, and that may be the home office or Starbucks. Um, communications to employees or patients, uh, protecting employees and facilities, thank you to the police department, um, and um, information services, as we've known, I mean, Todd's team has done a superb job um, to react to the threat that we've had over the weekend, and that's ongoing. So your departmental plans. So I, we've been bugging you to get those updated where they are missing, put them into place. Um, and uh, ideally, we want to do that in response not only to a deadline of May 31st, June 1st, but throughout the year as um, changes occur. We're large, dynamic organizations. So as um, your business changes, as your context changes, make those updates and um, keep those plans updated at all times. Also, communication effort, make sure that all team members are well and trained um, on the plans. Um, plans start with the um, business impact analysis backup recovery strategies, key contact information, again, constantly changing. I know it's a bear to stay on top of it, but it's, it's so key to communicate to all your team members, especially as roles and responsibilities may have to shift um, in response to um, a disaster. List of critical supplies to be kept on hand um, to have those available. So, in the, up down to an individual role now, um, know, every team member know the downtime procedures, the role um, that the department and the institution expects every one of us to play. Are you part of a ride out and relief team? And it's equally important do, through the duration of the disaster to continue providing services, but also after those team members have um, worked long hours that you will give them a break and, and, and take their place where that's expected from you. Good communication in terms of um, working from remote locations, I talked a little bit about that, or working from another facility. Do you know how to contact your supervisor and, um, or staff and um, ordering the, the supplies and when needed that you're familiar with those instructions? So. Thank you very much. My contact information, um, email, please, if you have any questions about your dep departmental planning processes, feel free, to, uh, feel free to reach out to me, email me, call me, Frank Valulis. Stephen? And by the way, in case you haven't heard, wear your badge. So, Lieutenant, you did yours in three slides. I can do mine in one. So really what it is, we're really just here to remind you of um, when, we, when we do have a disaster, when we do have a crisis, when we do have an emergency, um, just to highlight those wide variety of ways that we as a university will do our best to be able to keep in contact with you. Depending upon the emergency, depending upon what's going on, all of these things may be functioning, only a couple may be functioning, and we could even have episodes where all are out. But really it's about relying on all of the different channels that we actually have out there. So whether it's the website, you got UTMB alerts, um, the social media, so signing up and making sure you're on um, I am UTMB for the, for the organizational Facebook page. Watch those, we will be doing our best to keep those up to date for overall high level about really what's going on, how are the different campuses affected, uh, and how do we need to be communicating. I do wanna make sure that we do all know though that this does not take the place of working with your individual supervisor. Every work group um, and department needs to have their own plan, which we've been hearing a little bit about. And so your, your specific supervisor is the one that will be making that call under the direction of incident command um, about specifically what you need to be doing um, during that particular emergency. So knowing your departmental plan, knowing what that phone tree is, knowing how to stay in tech, a touch with your team and the supervisor is actually a really key for your work and then the overall channels for um, overall what's going on on campus. Um, and also with where, if you also haven't heard, alerts, please go in and sign up for alerts. Uh, we actually do recommend that there's a, you, can, you can choose the order by way in which you do receive 
um, uh, alerts. And we do really suggest that if you have a smartphone that you think about text first. Um, text seems to be the most reliable and will typically be uh, one of the last things that will actually end up going out. So just um, something to think about um, as you're looking at what your communication plan is overall as well. Uh, with that, we've been talking about cybersecurity and keeping confidential information um, secure. Louis Perrin from IT. Good afternoon, and I guess this year I get to be the, uh, the, the lucky dog that happens to be uh, talking to you about emergency preparation while we're actually going through a situation that could be an emergency scenario, and that's the cybersecurity threat that's been going around. Uh, just as a quick update, the last information that I have on the ransomware attack uh, is that it's affecting 25 countries, 105 health institutions so far. Uh, to date, I am not aware, and I'm trying to answer some questions that I know I'm going to be getting here shortly, I am not aware of any direct impact to UTMB uh, from this particular set of circumstances. Now, having said that, information security or emergency preparation in information security, cybersecurity, is really the process of reinforcing knowledge and processes that we need to pretty much take uh, care of all year long. It's not something that we actually have a line in the sand that we can draw on. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and begin that reinforcement or a little bit of that reinforcement right now. The Texas Commerce Code defines confidential information as an individual's first name, last name, and a whole lot of other data sequences here that I could give y'all real quick, okay? Uh, for some of y'all, this is going to look like uh, protected health information. For some, it's going to be uh, personally identifiable information. For some, it's going to be student information. It's going to look different for different folks. But, uh, and the definition is going to be varied. But the bottom uh, line is, is this is what we have a legal obligation to protect. Uh, and it's also, in general terms, when we're in an emergency situation, what it is that the cyber criminals are after. Are the threats to our information real? Well, this is some numbers that have been compiled over the past uh, couple of years, and these wind up working out averages. Uh, 60,000 plus suspicious or malicious hacking attempts are blocked on a per hour basis. So it happens, and it happens frequently. Uh, our malware systems block more than 30, or 350,000 viruses or trojans per year. Uh, hopefully, in a lot of cases, that's going to be the ones like uh, what are delivering the ransomware attack that we're, is going on currently. And 70 million pieces of spam are filtered out annually, blocking numerous phishing attacks, ransomware attacks, incidents, uh, and different scams. Now, nothing is foolproof, but we're trying to do this on a routine basis. This is what we have to stay on top of routinely. Uh, and when they occur, we actually do have to respond to approximately 1,300 uh, security-related instances on a yearly basis. Some of that's misuse, some of that's actually compromises, security breaches, virus incidences, so on and so forth. So they are real, the threat is real to our information. Biggest threats that are currently going on right now, they're changing, but these are the big ones. First one is phishing. Uh, this is a social engineering attack where they, uh, the cyber criminal is attempting to trick you into providing potentially confidential information and the, potential, and the information that they're really after is your username and password. If they can get hold of that, then uh, basically they can get hold of a lot of other information. Uh, and they're going to do this by using your good nature or our good nature against us. Uh, and our human nature against us. So you will receive, a common scenario is, is that you'll receive an email that says that there's a compensation error and you need to update your payroll records immediately if you want to get paid. I like my paycheck. I hope you like your paycheck. That's a pretty big deal. And to show you the, sense or the tricky nature of how they do this, they're going to send you this announcement at 4.30 on Time Card Friday. And they're going to hope that's going to be enough between that and the good flash. Yep. That and that little announcement up there that says compensation error update immediately. They're going to hope that between the timing of it and the uh, uh, subject line is going to be enough to get you to, to respond quickly and perhaps without being quite as diligent in your preparation and being not being quite as much on guard as you might normally be. Uh, there are a few 
couple of quick keys that you can uh, catch on to real quick that perhaps maybe everything is not just as it needs to be. Uh, the first of those is going to be who's sending the email. If it's not coming from a UTMB email account, why would they be asking you to update your information, particularly payroll information? So think about things like that. Even if it is a UTMB address, Take a little bit of extra time to go out there and double check the directory and find out if the person asking you to update your payroll records isn't really a transporter or animal researcher or somebody that you wouldn't normally think would have that kind of responsibility to do it uh, or to be making that request of you. Finally, the other thing that you can do is you can ask, ask yourselves, what is it they're asking you to do? Uh, UTMB will never ask you for your password. If they're asking you to put in a user ID and password, it's a scam. Something's wrong with that. They're not going to ask you for that information anytime. They don't need it. Our technicians, technical services does a great job of being able to keep our systems up to date, uh, keep our antivirus uh, secure, keeping our passwords protected and things of this nature, and they don't need our passwords to do it. So they're not going to ask you for it, and neither should anybody else. Uh, there are other Clues that you can catch on to if the link that they're trying to send you to is a non-UTMB link, and you can tell that simply by taking what's and doing what's called a mouse over. If you'll just take your mouse and move it over the top of the link, it'll actually show you the full path that it's trying to send you to. If that's not a UTMB address, there's a pretty good chance that what you're looking at is a scam. So take a look at these different things and just kind of like put two and two and two and two together. And if it adds up, disregard it. Delete it, let us know about it. We'll see what we can't do about taking care of it for you. Next one, ransomware. Anybody heard of this one recently? Ransomware is almost always a virus. Uh, occasionally, it can also be delivered through an infected website, but it's almost always a virus. And what it's going to do is it's going to encrypt all of the files or lock all of the files on your local computer system, and then it's going to try and then go out and access files out on the network and encrypt them as well. And then when you attempt to access those files, it's going to pop up a message that says, ha ha, your file's locked, pay me X number of dollars in bitcoins. Anybody know what a bitcoin is? Explain it to me later, okay? Uh, but if you don't pay X number of dollars in Bitcoins, you're not going to have access. And there's usually a countdown clock on there. You generally have like three days. And if you haven't done it in three days, you'll get another message. And if it hasn't happened in a couple of days after that, it's supposedly going to be a permanent lock, okay? A couple of things that you need to know about uh, ransomware is, A, again, it's a virus. If you're running an, an effective antivirus program that's up to date, you greatly reduce the chances that you're going to have to worry about ransomware. The other thing about it is, is it encrypts files and renders them useless. So, and this is something I'm gonna be talking about here in a little bit in the uh, to-do list. Uh, if the files are on your local computer, that's where it's going first. That's gonna be the most susceptible file. So the files on your desktop computer or on your laptop computer are the ones that are going to be locked or encrypted first. Those are the ones that are gonna wind up um, being affected first, and those are also the ones that we can do the least about. If your laptop gets infected with uh, ransomware software, there's a real good chance our procedure is going to be walk over, take that laptop or that desktop from you, walk it back, re-image it, bring it back to you, and say, please don't do that again. If those files are out on an H drive or out on a secure drive, on a network drive that gets backed up at least four times a day, if they get encrypted, we can pull the most recent information back very, very rapidly, and you wouldn't have, a, and you shouldn't have any problem with that. Okay. And finally, we're not going to pay. We're not going to pay the three hundred dollars in bitcoins, even though I think that's what one third of a bitcoin these days. Okay. And it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but when you multiply it times thirteen, fourteen, fifteen thousand computers that this thing could potentially spread to, that and think about it. These are cyber crooks, they're cyber criminals, they just infected your computer and now you're supposed to trust them to give you the key to unlock it if you pay them $300? No. So what do we do to uh, help prevent phishing? And what's been going on uh, that has led us up to the point right now where hopefully we're not going to have much of an impact from the latest ransomware, okay? First off is user education and awareness. 
making sure that y'all understand this is what's going on and this is the types of things that we're fighting. I just did a 35-minute uh, NEO session right across the hall for our new employees, and we try to do this on a routine basis. Spam filtering and antivirus at the, at the Internet Gateway. Uh, these are systems that are sitting out there before these emails ever get to you. Uh, and, and they work quite effectively. That's what's blocking those 70 million uh, potentially infected uh, virus infected emails on a, on a yearly basis. Email attachment filtering, making sure that executables and other files that viruses typically hide in get filtered out before they make it to your email is another important way of doing it. And of course, making sure that your desktop antivirus, anti spamware, and uh, Spam filtering systems are not only present, but they're up to date and running the way that they're supposed to be. Two-factor authentication. Uh, this is a secondary way of making sure that you are who you say that you are. When you log into our computers uh, remotely or log onto a system uh, from off-site remotely, uh, using either Citrix or VPN or web or Outlook webmail, uh, it requires not only your ID and password, but a second factor authentication. Currently, we're utilizing a program called Duo to facilitate that, and it is working and doing a lot of good for us. Incident response, we talked about the 1,300 plus incidences that we operate or that we've done on a yearly basis. We continue to do that. Uh, there's a whole lot of activity that's involved in that that would take a lot longer than this uh, program will allow me to go into. And then, of course, backups and recovery strategies. Again, backups out on our file servers are done uh, at least daily and usually on the order of four times a day, whereas the backups on your laptops and, and desktop units probably aren't being done at all. So remember, that's the safe place to keep your information. Pre-emergency checklist, know your support level and tiers, particularly if your computer is supported by IS, uh, it has a tier level. Basically what that means is what's going to happen when in terms of an emergency. Uh, the lower level tier machines are gonna be shut down first, they're gonna be brought up last. That's gonna work their way all the way up through what's referred to as the persistent tier. These are systems that we're gonna try never to shut down because they're backbone systems. They're things like our email system, they're things like our networks and things of this nature. We will try never to shut them down, but if we do have to shut them down, it's certainly gonna be the last thing that goes down. Where's your data? making sure that you've got data out on network file servers rather than on laptops or desktop units. That's the way it can be protected for you. Who has access to your data? Can the administrator access the data after an emergency? Uh, ways around this are things like escrowed accounts, uh, having multiple administrators. Again, in an emergency situation, you don't know who's gonna be available and when. So take care of that and make sure that they do have access. And then who has access to data too? That's going to be, uh, can the users get into their data? Uh, are they set up for remote access? And if they are set up for remote access, are they familiar with how to use it and the two-factor authentication process? We want business to be able to continue running even if the people aren't here, and that's gonna be one of the ways it's gonna, that it's going to have to happen. And that is my quick checklist, and next is Mike Mastrangelo from Business Operation and Facilities. All right, now I'm going to ask Ed Smith to help me out, but I do need a volunteer. Any volunteers? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, Steve Campbell, come on up. Okay, so uh, there have been a number of attacks, um, you know, for example, the Boston bombing. Uh, and then you, uh, Have a seat. This isn't going to hurt, right? No, it won't hurt. Um, the, uh, some of the, um, uh, what we call now combined complex uh, coordinated terrorist attacks where they'll actually go in and, and shoot up a bunch of different places at the same time. Well, um, following these, there's been some uh, thinking about how best to respond to these. And uh, one of the things comes out, uh, it's called the Hartford Consensus. It's really about doing really uh, fast hemorrhage control and then moving the patients quickly as possible to definitive care. So I just wanted to give you a preview of some training that we'd like to roll out here. And I've asked Ed, uh, Ed to come up here and, and, and help me out because he's actually qualified to give this training. And, and uh, I'm just going to give you a preview, though. Uh, so any questions that come up, too, we're going to have Ed, Ed address. Um, so uh, one of the key things that we've got here, we, we, were, we did manage to go out and get some kits. Now, we don't have enough for everybody, but we can give some, we'll, you know, we'll try to get more. We'll give some folks ideas about what's in the content and how you can build a kit, and we, we might be able to get uh, some additional ones as well. 
there's a, uh, a tourniquet was developed by the military. It's really effective. I want to go over that. And then uh, uh, these uh, bandages that have hemostatic agents in them. This particular one has kaolin in it. It helps uh, to control the ble bleeding pretty quickly. So you, uh, they also have gloves so you, so you can protect yourself, protect the person. And uh, the first thing you always want to do is to um, try to apply pressure. Now, in a bombing incident, you, you, know, you may see right away there's an amputation of an extremity and uh, pressure's not going to work, so you want to move quickly to the... Uh, to the tourniquet, but let's say that uh, uh, let's say that Steve has a uh, a wound. Okay, well we, we need to we need to figure out what's going on here, and then potentially uh, you know see if we need to apply whoa, some. Whoa, 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 whoa! That's a why is that new shirt? I... Okay, so yeah. let's say he's bleeding right here. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna try our hemostatic agent. Okay, we're gonna try to apply pressure. Okay, and it's not working. So then maybe one of the things we want to do is use this tourniquet. Okay, so you open it up. There's one here if you need. Okay, and uh, it's, it's for a good cause, Steve. Yeah. It's for a good cause. And um, you'll see the red tab here, okay? And basically what you do is you slip it on, on, on the joint above the wound, okay? You tighten it up, and uh, if you tighten it to the point where you can't fit a finger comfortably under there. It basically, it just takes one turn. Now tell me, tell me if this stops. One stop. turn, okay, and you close it basically. It'll latch here in this clip. It's working. <laughs> you, uh, you put this here and you write the time down, okay? And then you should not get a distal pulse. So let's go ahead and take that off. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Okay, let's say, <laughs> let's say hypothetically, He's got two wounds, one on each arm, and we don't have a, another tourniquet. Well, we can improvise. And my favorite time. We can improvise and fashion a tourniquet out of something like a tie or a belt or something like that. And in this, in this, uh, Walmart. <laughs> it's a clip-off. It's awesome. Okay, you could use this, and now, now you'd actually have to use something here as, uh, to, to turn it, but basically you can um, a pen or something like that. Ed? You can use an ink pen, a pencil, something long and sturdy and twist. Yeah, anything like that. Now, let's suppose, let's suppose that Steve has a head injury. What would we do then? <laughs> oh, uh, that would, would, Ed, would that, no, that wouldn't work, okay. Well, one thing, we could, we could try to apply pressure, again, with our hemostatic agent here, okay. And then the other thing, too, we have in the kits is a uh, compression bandage. And one thing nice you notice about this, it doesn't completely unravel. So they put a little bit of thought about how to do this, right. So you could put this over the wound. He's doing a good job. <laughs> we can put this over the wound. It's stopping the flow, let me tell you. <laughs> and then, you, you know, you could simply wrap the last one underneath. The other thing, too, is if we did use the hemostatic agent, or this, one of the things we might want to do is take this, fold it, and slip it under there just to let the docs know that uh, something was like, Mary, do you want to get a picture, Steve, while we're in? <laughs> oh, you got one, okay. All right, so uh, Ed, is there anything that I forgot? Oh, so we covered it. using pressure, using the tourniquets, uh, using the compression bandage. I'll go ahead and take this off for you. Just know if you come into our emergency department, we're gonna cut your clothes off, so that's <laughs> what's gonna happen. Beware, but uh, it's no different than teaching you guys how to do CPR. It's teaching you how to stop bleeding. It saves a lot of lives. So. We do have, instead of using Steve for this part of the demo, we do have this training aid that we'll use in the, um, in the training. And basically, you have a wound here. You can actually reach in there. You can feel where the bleeding's coming out. And then what you can do is, with the same Z-fold uh, bandage, basically reach in, apply pressure to where that wound is, okay? and then continue to put pressure on, we can pack that wound 
okay? And I've seen where the, I think the military's done this, and they've used animals to demonstrate, and even with a femoral cut, uh, they were able to stop it with this. And uh, you basically, you pack it in. Anything that you'd add here, Ed? They just pack it in and make sure the agent reacts and starts to Okay, it. suppose it doesn't. Suppose it keeps, uh, should you pull out and repack it? Or? No, you leave it, leave it in there and keep putting more pressure okay. on it. Okay, okay. All right. Um, are there any questions? Uh, that, that basically wraps up. The, 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 let's give a Steve a round yeah. of applause for our demonstration. And with that, uh, let's introduce uh, Chuck Carlisle for, his, uh, for the final uh, uh, demonstration. All right, uh, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I would like to uh, paint you a brief picture of what happened back on uh, January 4th since uh, fire and life safety is my uh, bread and butter. Um, from our perspective, at about 1.18, uh, we received a phone call on a fire phone, you know, 21211. Shameless plug right there, right? 21211. Only it was a little bit different. This time, it caused the entire uh, office just to kind of stop and listen. Then we got another phone call. And this time, visible smoke and flames, heavy black smoke. Well, at 1.20, <clears throat> excuse me, at 1.20, we arrived at John Lee Hospital with uh, Galveston Fire Department hot on our heels. Needless to say, we started that investigation really, really quickly with a sense of urgency. We immediately greeted, we were immediately greeted with reports of heavy smoke on floors eight, nine, some on three, and certainly on two. Before we had enough time to really gauge the scope of the fire, the decision was, decision was made to evacuate the building. And rightfully so. Some units had already started evacuating um, and that was the right decision when faced with those kinds of circumstances. They did the right thing. At about 122 the ceiling collapsed in the second floor at the fire the point of the fire origin and that took out the fire alarm system in that just in that area. The fire alarm system continued to operate and did what it was supposed to in shutting down air handlers and alarming the occupants of the building do all things it was supposed to do, as did the rest of the building fire safety systems. The fire doors closed, the, the air handlers shut down, all those fire systems worked. And that's largely in part to the good maintenance, actually the great maintenance and the attention to detail that's been going on throughout the years, the boring things that happen day to day. Somewhere between 1.30 and 1.45, the John Sully Hospital was fully evacuated. 1.30 and 1.45, remember these times. Um, and the rest of the buildings were in the, pro in the core were in the process of being evacuated or were largely evacuated. The initial cleanup effort started at 1.50. That's 32 minutes from the first alarm to the start of the recovery activities that continue to this day. Um, so what did we learn? Well, staff performed fantastic. No one was injured during the evacuation of this hospital. And it was evacuated quicker than I could have ever thought possible. In, 30, in under 30 minutes, we evacuated the entire hospital with, again, zero injuries. And that was due to the caring of the people, the staff involved. Um, I can't emphasize this hard enough. I'm really proud to be on this team that cares this much and performs this well when the chips are down. Um, it's a real, it, it's a good feeling to be on this team. We've also learned that in the early fog confusion, in those first 15 minutes, we can improve our response a little bit. We can get whatever information we have out to the occupants a little bit quicker and co coordinate our emergency responses a little more efficiently with particular attention to our own responders' roles. These skids, um, they work out fairly well, but we could probably use a few more of them. We also found out that we needed to update our response guidelines for those first few critical minutes and train and drill and repeat. We also found out the incident command system uh, worked really well. It ramped up, but in those first few minutes we need to do just a little bit more. And so that's exactly what we're working on. These things were, these SCEDs were used during the um, uh, during the fire and the evacuation, and we got pretty positive reviews on them. Being just a simple person taco, they work pretty good. 
Um, besides having put together new emergency guidelines, we've also co been coordinating with Galveston, Galveston Fire Department, State Fire Marshal. I didn't realize how many State Fire Marshals we have, but we've got quite a few and they've visited us a few times. But it's been good. It's been good, um, uh, good meetings. We've learned a lot. There's a lot of coordination going on. And um, we've learned that we need a little bit tighter response on those first few minutes for emergency responders, uh, some tools that we can give them. So we're going to make better use of mass notification systems. For once, uh, for one, the live announcements we can make across our fire alarm system across the entire core. For example, we can take um, and make a prescripted message like active fire, John Silly Hospital, second floor, elevator lobby, going out to the entire group of core buildings live. Secondly, we could follow up with, attention, Jenny Silly Hospital, prepare to receive patients from the John Silly Hospital. So that the people that are receiving these patients that are being evacuated um, will have a little bit of heads up, people just not showing up on the doorstep. We're going to use some more phone, phone call down trees, kind of tweak that process a little bit better to target our specific uh, responders and uh, make better use of our resources in the call center, tweak the delivery of our Everbridge announcements. Um, these tra this training, <coughs> excuse me, this training to our first responders has already begun. We've already started doing that. We put together those packages and we're starting to do the delivery. Uh, most of the train changes that we're envisioning and that are happening are going to be transparent to the majority of the UTMB personnel unless you, you are part of a drill or part of an actual event. After we finish the training, we're going to start conducting drills and we're going to coordinate these with Galveston Fire Department and uh, make them really well coordinated. They're going to be announced. They're going to be um, uh, several announcements going out. We're looking at the, uh, early June to mid-June to start these particular announcements. So um, how can you be prepared? Um, first, in general, your first response to a fire alarm event, this is to the first fire alarm you get, will depend on the type of building you're in, right? And this is all in part of your health, general health care safety training. When you're in a health care building, prepare to evacuate. When you're in a high-rise building, a building over 75 feet and is not health care, you're going to do a staged evacuation. You go to a stairwell, you get ready, you wait for more announcements, unless it's obvious to leave, and then if you're told to leave, you leave. In other buildings, like most of the freestanding clinics um, and business occupancies, you just evacuate and you go to your rally point. Um, when there is a confirmed fire, first responders will follow up with live voice announcements in plain language, not coded, not doctor read. Um, that's in effect right now, of course. And if it's obvious, you just leave. Don't wait for any cues. If it's obvious, smoke and fire, you just take through that. Q, that's your cue to leave. Um, and by the way, another uh, public safety announcement, make sure you have a fire plan for your house as well. Don't wait till later when you gotta meet your kids. Where are you gonna meet? You're gonna meet out on the lawn so we, the fire department can tell. Have your own little rally point. Make sure your fire extinguisher is up to date, ready to go. If you have a dry chemical fire extinguisher every year, you gotta shake it, make the little chemical go back and forth and doesn't make a clump and so it'll work when you need it in case you uh, have a grease fire on the stove or something. Um, having said that, I believe that will do. Thank you. I think we had already 10 minutes uh, ahead of our schedule so I'm going to stop right here. If you have any questions, please come over here to ask any questions. Thank you all for coming. UTM, working together to work wonders.